G'day, I'm Tim Thompson. One of the things I love to do is find out how things are made and why they're made that way. And so for that reason, I'm at Dungarubba in New South Wales at Australian Concrete Posts to find out about the manufacture of concrete posts and indeed why they're made the way they are. This promises to be a fascinating little video behind the scenes making a product that's a lot more complex than you initially realised. G'day Richard, how are you mate? Hello Tim, good to have you here at my factory. Oh mate, it's brilliant to finally be here. We had COVID and then we had floods and you yes. guys were underwater I believe. Yes, um, flood water came through here, it was at least uh, two and a half metres high, yep. coming through this whole factory area and the whole surrounding area. Mate, and you've come back, you're a yes. local employer, you use Australian products yes. and you make a fence post that you've developed and designed over time that you think is pretty good. Yep. And it's actually been one of is it the only Australian concrete post that meets the road boards? Yes, it meets all the specifications for main roads. Yep. Um, as well as all the needs for farmers and industry. There's a lot of technology goes into making a concrete post. There's a yep. lot of little things that you think are simple that yes. take a long time to figure out. Yes. So let's go and have a look at how you make them to find out about some of the products that you developed along the way that you've done away with and yes. why you've done away with them. Yep, more than happy to show you. Let's go and have a look. Let's go and look. So Richard, this is an impressive jig and it's an impressive mould. This is where you're about to do a pour, I believe. Yes, yeah, so we'll do a pour here in about uh, 15 minutes. They're just finalising, getting the wires uh, set up, finalising the wire on this bed. Yep. Um, the important thing about the wires, pre-stressing wires, every wire is put through the same position in the mould. So this jig is really heavy and it's set up to keep these posts exactly in the right position for the pour. That's correct. So this stressing bed has about 120 tonne of load on it. Yep. When we stress it, each one of these wires is stressed about two and a half tonne uh, strand. So 120 tonne of compression pressure yep. on this bed before yes. you start your pour. Before we start the pour. And then you leave the concrete in for about 12 hours. Leave it in for 12 hours. Yep. Um, the critical thing about the concrete is that the concrete's got to be strong enough to grab that steel. Yep. That two and a half tonne of steel on that. Yep. So when we actually release it the next day, um, the, con the concrete post will actually shrink two or three mil from that steel just being pulling back into tension. So let me get this straight. Set concrete posts. Yes will actually shrink yes. because of the tension that's on correct. the pre-stressing of this wire. That's correct. And that's the same as when they do a bridge girder. They, do they call it okay. pre, this is a pre-stress, yes. and they do a bridge girder, they do a post-stress. But the principle's the same. There are people who would say, I can make a concrete poster, just get some Rio, chuck it in a mould, get some bags of concrete, pour it in. Yep. What's the critical component of pre-stressing this wire? It allows you to actually take the post and use it a post driver to heat it in. Right. If you didn't pre-stress a post, um, it doesn't matter how big you make it, if you hit it, it'll just explode from the pressure of the, the rammer hitting it, hitting it. So each wire has about two and a half tonne tension on it. Yep. And it's really critical to get it in the right position. Yep. Because um, one, you need the correct amount of coverage around the, the wire for the cement, and that yes. just prevents the moisture getting in and uh, causing any potential rusting. So the wire's got to be embedded right in the middle of the post and it can't vary up and down. Can't vary by more than uh, one or two mil. If you go to three mil, yep. the tension's so great it'll actually bow the post um, from the tension being placed on the wire. So if the wire is three mil lower at the start than it is at the finish, that'll yes. actually bend the post like a banana. Yeah, if, you, if, it's, if the wire's slightly out, and it, it won't bend down because it's yep. got so much tension. It'd be if it's offset by two or three mil, yes. that's what will actually cause the post to bow. Yep. This is high tensile steel. Yep. It's the same steel they use in making railway sleepers uh, for the railways. It's the same steel they use for making uh, bridge girders. Same steel they use for pylons. So the steel okay. is very critical what we actually use in the type of steel we're using. And you're using Australian steel in this? All comes from Newcastle. We, we all buy everything that we can locally. Nothing's yep. imported. So I've, I've spoken to people who say, oh yeah, concrete posts will last you 10 or 20 years and then the, yep. the, the steel Rio inside will, yep. will swell as yep. it rusts, yep. they'll crack, they'll fall apart. Yep. 
It's basically because they're using a low carbon mild steel for their Rio that's and that, they're not pre-tensioning it. That's correct. It all comes down to the quality of the product you're actually working with. Yeah. Because these concrete posts are specified for roads and maritime, we have to guarantee yep. them for the highway, the government. Yep. They need certain criteria met in the concrete mix and the steel. Yep. And therefore, that's why we don't make the concrete ourselves. We actually get it brought into us from a concrete plant. Now, is, there, is it a special concrete? Like we've got special pre-stressed Rio in here, we've got special beds, are we using special concrete Yeah, as I'm well? giving away my trade secret, secrets now. Yeah. But yes, it is a specialised concrete. So the concrete itself um, doesn't have lime in it. So right. lime is one of the things that activates uh, corrosion yes. in concrete. So yeah, we reduce anyone that. Anyone who's used lime on their hands knows so that we it reduce that quality so that's one of the sec trade secrets of why the posts gonna last longer and we get okay. to give that hundred year guarantee yeah cool yeah. all right well I can't wait to watch your pour yes as I say in the classics let's have a look while we're waiting yep. at some you did earlier yep no welcome let's come over here all right let's go and have a look guys now we're in the yard at the moment Richard. yes um, this is our reject section this is our reject section I love coming to the reject section because it tells me a lot about the product and a lot about the people that produce it. Yep, yep. Because everyone has rejects. Yep. Um, and you've got some great stories to tell over here. We've got a bent post and you want to show me oh. exactly why, it's, why a reject. it's a reject and why the position of the Rio is so important. Very much so. So right, come and look at this post over here. Yep. So Tim, here, here's a perfect example of a reject post. This post here, as you can see, the wires aren't in the centre like this, this one up here. But when you look at the post over here, you can actually see the post, because it's off centre, that post actually has a bow in it from the pre-stressing of that post. So it really is a matter of a couple of mil. A couple of mil a couple is, of mil is crucial. critical. So That's in correct. that massive bed of post, yes. everything's got to be within a couple of mil or else you're going to lose money effectively, aren't effectively, you? Effectively, there's thousands of dollars get thrown away if it's not done correctly. So Richard, you don't just make the one style of post and it's a really interesting conversation we just had about insurance companies dictating how we fence and this is one of the reasons why when we go to another state we see fences are a bit different that's correct so each state has its own legislation about how fences need to be you never know the difference the importance of it until there's an accident and yep. then the insurance company gets involved so in Victoria, ACT and New South Wales, the requirements are on a road. Yep. A road front each fence needs to have a five wire strand fence. Can have more, but it Can must have, have more, a minimum, minimum of five. Minimum five. Um, and it also has to have a, the dropper spacing or the fence post spacing of no more than three metres. Right, so nine foot, three metre spacing. That's correct. Yeah. In Queensland, it's, it's different. So in Queensland, the, the requirements are four barbed fence on a roadway. Right. With a four metre spacing between the droppers or the fence posts on a roadway. And you were saying that's got to do with liability. That's so correct. So if stock gets out in New South Wales, Victoria, ACT, yep. and a car hits it, it's, it's the farmer's it's fault. It's the farmer's liability. But in Queensland, if you hit stock, yes. Well, you're the idiot that hit this big friggin' animal. It's yes, your so problem. now it's the, the driver's liability for hitting the stock. So that changes the way we fence? Changes the way we Simply fence and the interpretation changes how of liability. The, and the liability for the farmer. That's correct. That's amazing. And of course, you've come across that because all your posts have to have holes pre inserted in them at time of moulding. That's correct. So you're very familiar with that, whereas a lot of people that sell timber posts wouldn't even give that two seconds of thought, but that's, you've had to think it through. That's correct. So often um, the posts are made to be able to pull wire through, uh, and that also dictates of how they fence in different areas. Some areas they like to wire the, the fence, the wire on the outside, and so they yes. twitch it through the, the hole, they twitch it through it. Yep. Others are like to pull the wire through. So that just depends on the area that farmers are farming. And you, for sheep farmers, actually have notched posts so that they can attach their sheep mesh to the front of the post. That's correct. Um, and to simply twitch around the post. That's correct. And also because of the less pressure on the post, that can actually be a slightly smaller post. Okay. Uh, as a compared to uh, where there's areas where there's mainly cattle, uh, which is the majority of the areas we send the concrete fence post to, the pressures on the post are greater from the animals pushing through it, rubbing on it. Um, from things like that. And Queenslanders reckon their cows jump high? 
So the interesting thing when we go through, love Queenslanders, um, my best customers, don't get me wrong. Oh, they're lovely so, people. So I like them. So in Queensland, um, they like a taller post. They they really like a post that's seven foot, yep. around the seven foot. Yep. Um, and early on, I've been asking why they like a seven foot post, as opposed to New South Wales, Victoria prefer a six foot, six foot four post. Yep. Um, the, the answer that always comes back to is the cows jump higher and the Brahmins jump higher than the Herefords in New South Wales. So it's a competition the, thing. It is a competition thing, you know? Yeah. Um, but when you actually go around to measure the posts, because I've been around measuring the posts, wondering why, why theirs jump are higher in the New South Wales, um, it's actually not that true. Everyone makes the fence about the same height. They might put the posts in the ground deeper. Yep. Um, but everyone fences to the same way. They either measure their post to their top button or to their tip, depending on how yep. tall the, the farm is, is putting it in. I, I reckon it's probably got something to do with soil type. Yes. And I reckon people have found in certain soil types, particularly even in New South Wales and the cracking black clays, yes. you need a longer post. Correct. So yes. people can get a seven foot post. Yes. So I reckon if you're in New South Wales and you're on cracking black clay, it's time to become a Queenslander. Yep. Um, and we won't mention the NRL folk that's... Exactly, uh, we won't go there. We won't go there. Won't go, won't no. go there. Um, it, very important. Um, in black soils, a lot of black soils, especially Darling Downs, um, West uh, Dubbo areas where there's black soils, they definitely need a longer post. And interesting, that is one of the reasons why we don't put a point on the concrete fence post. Right, because I have been asked by people in Victoria, because yep. they love pointed posts down yep. in Victoria, yep. why isn't there a point? Yep. There's a specific reason for that. As um, soon as you put a point on a post and you hit into the ground, yep. um, the ground now dictates where the post is going the to go. Direction. Yep. direction. So because the concrete post is slightly tapered as well, you can't get the exact amount of surface area on the post on one side. And then uh -huh. what happens is the soil gets... Yeah, because you, your posts are like a wedge shape. That's like correct. Piece, aren't yes, they? and yeah. that's to get them out of the mould. Yep. So once the soil starts moving it, Yep. It's nearly impossible to straighten it up. So you either got to pull it out and do it again. The other benefit of having a square post on the end is when it hits a tree root, it'll actually puncture through the tree root. Rather than skip rather off. Rather than skip off. Yeah, and same secondly, with rocks. And secondly, when it hits a rock, the post will actually bounce. So the post is, because it's a pre-stressed post, the, when, it, when you drop the hammer on and it hits a rock, yep. the post will, should actually deflect and, and bounce on top of that rock, not shatter. One thing about the concrete post in our production, it's the simple things that are the crucial things. Everyone might look at it and think it's very simple, it's very easy to do, but it's the simple details that go into it that are very, that are critical. With the, with the vibe, it's locked onto the screw it in and lock it onto the bed, so it bides deep. We've got to make sure that all our concrete is spread evenly all over the bed. As we level, just a quick level off, first up, get any excess. So the first five you use is a little bit longer than most. It's to settle all the concrete right into the bed to get all the air bubbles out as it goes through. Make sure that it's covered up nicely. So your process there is just to level it out nice and even, get all of the air bubbles out of the concrete, level it off, scrape any of the excess off, that you, way you can also find any low spots. Always leave, got to leave a little bit just at the end for any overflow that comes through, that's where it will drop on the ends of the post, so you've got to make sure that they're nice and even all the way through. So that's your first five. So your second one then, it's just a half one, but that's just to get rid of all the bubbles as they've come out of the bed, to make sure that they're all gone, but it's also settled back into the bed nice and evenly.
That one's also to make sure that all your posts are nice and level and nice and even so that they all come out the same, same quality as they go in. So, Richard, this is um, a post that's been an acid sulfide source for a while? Yeah, so this post is actually a 70-year-old post. Yeah. Uh, we pulled it out of a, the post near McLean, near the riverfront. Yeah, now um, you guys didn't make this one? No, so we didn't make this post. This is one of the original pre-stressed posts made by uh, a company called Monia. Yeah. And um, if you're anywhere near Goulburn and Canberra, you'll probably see about 180 kilometres of these still existing today, 70 years later, just yep. like the day they were put in. Yep. So the reason I carry this post around, I just bring it to show people the acid etching. You can see acid etching in the soil. So what yes. that is where the, the soil is actually eaten into the concrete. Yep. So how many years of etching are we looking at here, Richard? So we're talking about this post being in the ground for 60 years um, within a kilometre of the sea. Okay. And next to the so, river. so it's lost a few mil around the outside. Yes. But it's still structurally as intact as the day it was made. That's correct. So all that's happened is the, um, the, the acid sulfate soils actually etched away some of the um, concrete on the top. Yep. But it hasn't affected the integrity of the post. And one of the reasons we actually bring this post to show you is yep. we, this post has made the same process we do today, where the wire is pulled all the way through and at the end of the post you can see the wire still sticking through the end of the wire yep. but it hasn't it hasn't rusted but hasn't done the hasn't done the, hand so hasn't done the post hasn't swelled or split the steel hasn't been um, corroded swelled, swelled and split as you say and the secret to that is in your pre-stressing and stretching of that Comes wire back to the, it goes in like a bottle like a bottle. exactly it's back to the pre-stressing is the most important thing of this post now Richard, it's all very well to talk about your victories, but we all know that victories only come through failures. And yes. you've had a fair few failures developing product as well along the way, and you've yes. learnt from it. Yes. This is one of your failures, can you talk us through it a little bit? Okay, so this, when we first were developing concrete posts for Queensland Market, yep. um, we were really concerned about the transport issues, the weight being transferred, because freight, cost freight costs and yep. all that. Yep. So, uh, we knew what type of post we'd been to the market. We asked the customer what we wanted the whole configurations yep. and the length of po post he wanted. Yep. And then we came back um, and we designed a mould to suit that yes. product that yes. they wanted. What we found is um, a $70,000 experiment. Um, when we made the product, we took it to the market. Yep. We, these, these posts didn't comply to the roads and maritime specs like all our other posts do for New South Wales and Victoria that we are making. So we made this post for Queensland farmers. You made it thinner basically. We effectively know we made it shorter. Shorter, Thin, okay. Yeah, not okay. As, so the thickness is right, same as all the others, but it was actually 110 mil wide instead of 130 mil. Yep. And when we took it to the market, we found the first customer I took it to, he phoned me up and said the concrete posts are failing. Okay. So when I went to the farm, the post wasn't itself failing. It was the process of pulling the wires through that was actually causing it to fail. Okay, because they like to pull all the wires through at they once, like don't they? They like to pull four barb through at once with one tractor. Yeah. Um, and what we're finding is because of the size, it was 18% smaller. We'd never had the issue before with New South Wales and Victoria. Yeah. And uh, in the Queensland, the first job they were breaking um, it's a thousand K, so my guarantee to every customer is if you have issues with my post, I will personally drive to your farm to see what's going on. Yep. He phoned me up, I drove a thousand K to Billowee to see, see what was going on. Yeah. I got there, it wasn't my post was failing, it was the way it was putting in. So I didn't want to drive a thousand K more every time I sent it to a customer. Yes. So we came back. We pulled all the moulds off the bed in this big pile here, as you can see. $70,000 worth of moulds. They've been sitting in the shed for eight years, and we now make the same mould with 130 mil post, and we don't have any issues. It's a bloody big decision to make, isn't it? To pull 70 grand of investment out Yes. when you see one you, problem. Especially when you start in the company Yeah. Um, at the very beginning. But I can't afford to have my integrity compromised when yeah. I send my post out to people. 
I need to know that when I send it out, it's doing the right thing for what the customer wants. It's so often when I speak to entrepreneurs like yourself, um, who are making products for a massive market. Yep. It's so often similar stories of integrity, of personal integrity that comes across with making products. Yep. Um, and it's just, it's wonderful that the more successful people are, yep. the more likely I find them to admit to their mistakes and admit to their errors because yep. they find that's the only way that they learn and move forward. Yep. So, well done, mate. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we, we all learn from you and from your example. Don't be afraid to fail. It's through failure that we become successful. And we learn and make a better product. And that's in any industry. And we've just got to keep reminding ourselves of that every damn day, don't that's we? That's right. <laughs> so, Richard, you've not only designed posts, but then you had to design bracket systems to work with them. Tell me a little bit about that. Um, yeah, so one of the first things we found is um, to make uh, a standard system that you can use on all a whole lot of different applications. Yep. I had to come up with a patent bracketing system that could work for concrete fence posts. So the idea is that with a shifting spanner and a few brackets, you can make either a stay or a box end assembly with your concrete posts. That's correct. So you can do the box end. Um, you can do a varying length of the top rail, depending on what you want. Yep. The same simple bracket by just flipping it at an angle, you can go down an angle to a yep. diagonal stay. The big message with any end assembly is to make your top rail or your stay long enough. Yes. So the general rule for uh, to get the maths right, the trigonometry, is generally a top rail needs to be two and a half times the length of the height of your post. As a minimum. As a minimum. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Richard, Alan, thank you very much for hosting me at your amazing facility today. I've learned a lot, not just about the production of concrete posts, but about fencing and about business in general. And yep. um, I just wanted to ask you a couple of quick questions. If you were talking to a young bloke, say in his mid twenties, yep. who had a great idea, who really thought he could do it, yep. but he was just scared of taking that leap of faith, yep. what advice would you give? Take the leap. If you've got faith in your product and, and, and you work at it, it'll work. Yep. And you guys have had some failures. Yeah, so one of the lessons we've learned through the process, so Al and I come from totally different backgrounds. Mm -hmm. uh, we only met 10, 15, 15 years, years ago yeah, when we started. Yeah, right, yeah. Um, if there's a young bloke starting out, the most important thing is not to be afraid of failure. You're always going to fail in something. Yep. It's how you overcome it. Yep. It's the belief in yourself. It's the belief that if something fails, it's one extra lesson learned not to do it. So you're closer to your goal. If something fails, you know that's not the way to do it, therefore there must be another way. Like the Kentucky Fried Chicken Man story, yeah. he went to 87 different stores, wanted to do his product. Every time he believed in it, he kept on going until he got the end product. And there you have a story there. So it's almost a person who is not an entrepreneur, who works for someone else, is scared of failure. Yep. If you believe that failure is going to be inevitable, and yep. you are going to fail, but you're going to do it anyway, yes. that's what makes you an entrepreneur. That's correct. Yeah. Yes. Is that correct? The hardest thing for, we find, um, young people come in through our business, working for us, or um, kids who do sport with us, or we coach, is we find the fear of having failing at something almost puts them in paralysis not to do anything. So they inevitably fail, but they fail permanently. Well, they, they, they fail before there. they even get to it. They fail because they haven't even given it a go. Yeah. yeah. And the other thing is, is, if you do fail, is don't let that hold you back to try again. Yeah. Yep. If you're going to bump your head along the road and things aren't going to go smoothly, but if you keep knocking at it, it's going to happen. You know, you're yeah. going to get over those bumps in here. Every bump is a bump that you know you're not going to hit next time. Mm. Yeah. Now, I'll give you a perfect example. We, we've got concrete fence posts here. When we first started, we thought, um, I read did all the research, the best way to stress the concrete fence post was had a hand stressing machine. Mm -hmm. um, we tried that. Um, it, we, we, it was a bit dodgy when we tried the first time, or when, if it didn't feel safe. So what we did is we went and put a bed up 12 metres long just for a trial 
and we cut the stainless steel, I mean not the stainless steel, the steel wire, and we thought it just like normal wire when you cut wire it rolls up and rolls. Yep. Okay, well when we do, do when you've got a piece of um, uh, steel that's under two and a half ton tension, when you cut it in the middle, it doesn't coil. It literally goes oh, like, a like a bullet. Either way. So when we first started, we thought, oh, this is a way to do it. We came to do the safety test on it. It, it failed miserably. It, it literally, um, the six meters went one way, six meters went the other way, and it didn't stop. It punched through the walls 20 meters away like a bullet went through it. Instantly it changed what we had to do. Three months later, to rectify, so that put our whole production back for three months when we started a brand new business, just so we could overcome a safety thing from that. And about thirty thousand dollars. Yeah. So it was. It, we thought we knew what we we're doing. We tested it. Didn't work. It failed. We had to go away to the drawing board, redesign it. A lot more money. A lot more safer. The end product's a lot more safer. We comfortably can sit here and allow people to go and work in our factory, knowing that we made it safer. Mm. So th that's just one example of how things can fail, never mind other businesses as well. Gentlemen, your story is inspirational. I love what you're doing here. I love how you're creating jobs in your local community, yep. using Australian made products for Australians. Um, it's a fantastic story of perseverance, strength of character, and it's inspiring. Thank you very much for spending your time with me today. Thanks, really Tim. Thanks for having me here. Yeah. Thanks, Tim. Thanks very Thank much, you, Richard. Richard. Have you. Um, and guys, if you are thinking about working for yourself, if you are thinking about doing something, hopefully there's some good words of wisdom. Give us a call. We're happy to help bounce ideas off us. There's plenty of ideas there and there's a lot of things people can do. We don't necessarily want to steal them. We're just really happy to help anyone moving forward. And generosity of spirit is something else that I've always seen with entrepreneurs. You're very generous people. So thank you for being so generous with your time. No, thank you. Thanks, Justin. Awesome. Thank you.